All right, everybody, welcome back for our second presentation today of our, what I've been calling our Squiminar, a seminar on railroading here in beautiful Squim, Washington. Um, we are using the magic of science right now because we're gonna have a guest join us remotely from Darrington, Washington. Uh, former Milwaukee Road employee, Alan Miller. Alan worked out here for a number of years. So Alan Miller was smitten with an interest in trains at an early age. His favorite railroad, the Milwaukee Road, ran through his hometown of Duval, Washington. Alan is what we call a railroad boomer. Boomers travel for work from place to place and job to job, on the move, always looking forward to the next experience. His railroad career began at age 19 on the Rock Island lines in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Next, Allen worked for the Burlington Northern, first at Everett, then Skykomish, and finally Lester, Washington. Allen hired on with the Milwaukee Road in September of 1971. He started at Kittitas and ended at Kent when the Milwaukee Road shut down in the spring of 1980. During those no nine years, Allen worked at every station in operation on the Milwaukee Road's Coast Division. He worked in Port Angeles. That's why he's here today. We're going to be talking about that. Allen is a preeminent expert on the Milwaukee Road's Coast Division, both through his personal experiences and his exhaustive research. Allen is a Clint Eastwood fan, so any Clint Eastwood questions will have to wait to the end. Married for 54 years, Alan has three children and seven grandchildren, and he's joining us today from his home in Darrington, Washington. Today, Alan will be talking about his, early, his personal experiences working for the Milwaukee Road in Port Angeles. And we're gonna take a look at some vintage images by John Illman along the way. So go ahead, Alan. Uh, why don't you go make my day? How'd that sound? You feel lucky, punk? So, Alan, tell us who this guy is. It's me. Ring a it's you. <laughs> and what are you doing? Yeah. Well, the one on the left is uh, the last station I worked, which is at Kent, Washington. And a young rail fan wandered into the depot one evening and uh, took a couple of pictures of me copying train orders at the operator's table there. He was kind enough to make prints of them and send them to me later. And the picture on the right was several years earlier when I was working at the uh, Everett Washington Depot. What is this contraption the, uh, the, with the tape here? Can you see that? This is a teletype machine that Alan would enter various information in, and then it would uh, run through here. And actually, that's uh, what we'd also call a, a ticker tape. Um, some people would call that that as well. So here was an incident. Now, Alan wasn't a part of this. In this case, what happened was the, on December 31st, 1949, the Milwaukee Road barge was parked in Elliott Bay and it got rammed and sunk by a freighter. And there were four crewmen on board the barge that was sunk. And the next day, the Seattle PI went out and took a picture and said, these are out of their element. See, these cars, of course, were loaded with lumber, and that's what made them buoyant. So, so, so that's what happened there. And so here were some of the people. Now, this is a list of people that worked on the various barges. And we can see here that Mr. Harry Everett Wilson started in 1909. So that was the very first, right when the railroad began and then became a barge captain in 1912 because that's when the Milwaukee got their first uh, tugboat. And so three of the four people that were rescued were on this list from that uh, crash in 1949. So Alan's also an artist and he's a very good artist and he drew this picture and we're gonna talk about this in a little bit more detail this afternoon when we do the Seattle and North Coast reunion. But as the cartoon says, Maybe it's first we land the barge and then we lower the slip because they accidentally pushed the car off the edge of the barge before the, uh, the, the before they got to the dock. So what do we got going on here? Well, this is loading the uh, barges at uh, the Seattle barge slip. I think it was Pier 27. And uh, you can see in front of the locomotive, there's a couple of 
flat cars, those were idlers that they used to push the cars over, over the apron and on it. They didn't have to run the heavy locomotive over the, the uh, apron slip. Because they don't like to run the locomotive on there unless they absolutely have to, right? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. The locomotive could go over it, but it was uh, much heavier than the regular cars. Uh, got a chance to run that engine over the barge uh, or the slip there any more than necessary. Okay. This is a, by the way, folks, this is one of the first images that we're going to see today by John Illman. Uh, like I said earlier, Mr. Illman's from Nordland, Washington, and we have his photographs today to share courtesy of the Center for Railroad Photography and Art in Madison, Wisconsin. So here we got another picture. This is in 1980. So this is actually in the Seattle and North Coast era then, right, Alan? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's after the Milwaukee had uh, departed. But they're still using a Milwaukee engine. So they just hadn't gotten around to painting it yet then. Yeah, Seattle, North Coast. Uh, uh, we, uh, was forming it I mean, get, uh, their own fleet of locomotives and they were probably using this Milwaukee switcher until they could get their engines in, in order. So you worked in this, uh, in the Port Angeles Depot, the picture that we see at the left, right? Correct? Yeah, I, that was my office in there. So you're, uh, you would have sat like, there. right by, by these windows or by those windows? Well, by the windows there under that uh, Milwaukee sign on the side of the building. Okay. And what was it, how was it that you came to work in Port Angeles? What was the circumstances associated with that? Well, I was on what they call the extra board, which uh, means I didn't have a permanent assignment. I just went around and relieved other people on permanent assignments uh, for vacations or any other reason that they had to take time off. And uh, so Port Angeles uh, vacancy came up uh, in the fall of uh, 73. Uh, Sam Wald, that was the agent there, used to take a couple weeks off every fall and go uh, deer. All right. Okay. And you, so then you filled in as the station agent. And what did you, what do station agents do back in those eras? Well, there's so much business there that I spent most of the day just hammering out way bills and fixing rates. And uh, we were there that work back there where you see those three windows on the side of the yeah. building. Okay. Her desk was back there. And her name was Jean Hannafy, and she was married to a conductor, Don Hannafy, that worked on the local. And uh, she did the other monthly, weekly, and daily report for cars down at the scale house. And, uh, and then I handled any phone calls from the shippers and stuff like that. So here's a floor plan from your collection of the freight house. Now, it uh, changed over the years from this drawing, didn't it? Yeah, the bu building as built was a kind of L-shaped thing. Uh, squared it off by adding more space there uh, behind the office. And then these uh, these doors, I'm going to flip back to the other image for a second, were, were actually where these windows are. Those at one time used to be doors for the freight house? Yeah, those were uh, uh, double doors that went into the freight house, but they uh, remodeled the depot because they were their own... Uh, division over there and they had their own uh, uh, train dispatcher. So they made that into a train dispatcher's office uh, and moved him out of the a little more room for the agent and the clerk. The uh, when I uh, During the time I worked there, that uh, what had been the chief dispatcher's office was now the section foreman's office. And the section foreman was named Arnie Westerfield. Oh, OK. So here's a, here's a timetable, and we're going to just talk a little bit about railroad operations. So one of the things that a timetable does is it provides authorization for a scheduled train movement. In this case, we see that train 96 leaves Port Angeles at 5 a.m. and is scheduled to arrive at Port Townsend at 8.05. So that would be 5 a.m. and 8.05. And I actually picked the June 1953 timetable because it's going to be relevant 
to some pictures that we looked at. So Alan, along with uh, timetables, another way that we can move a train is by a train order. And this is a train order. And these are for extra trains that are not part of the schedule. So in this case, this train order, which was from Alan's collection, which was actually written by Alan himself, on November 74, the engine 533 works extra between Port Angeles and Port Townsend. Alan copied the order from the dispatcher and the dispatcher's initials are the, are the authorization there on top of that. So here's another example. Now this is a little more complicated and this involves the station agent at Port Angeles, Johnny Sandwald, and it was always J-O-H-N-N-I-E. Sandwald, and he had a certain typing style. I don't know if we can all remember when we used to have flying capitals for manual typewriters, but this is explaining to us that engine 545 is going from Port Angeles to Port Townsend, and then afterwards the 502 is going to come back. So they actually swapped locomotives at Port Townsend because one of them was going in to have service. And then this was sort of Johnny's note to the crew explaining what was going on. They need to pick up a carload of lumber at Tukey's. Now I've seen it Tukey's with apostrophe S and I've seen it Tukey's without an S and I've seen it as Tukey with no S. So um, in this case, it's Tukey's and he's just living instructions for what the crew is supposed to be doing that night with this train. So here's a John Ilman photo that we have from July 22nd, 1953 in Port Townsend, the other side of the planet over there in Jefferson County. And this was right at the end of steam operations for the Milwaukee Road on the entire coast division. So Mr. Ilman lived in Nordland. He actually retired there after a career in the oil industry in the Bay Area working for Shell Oil Company and moved up here and took many notable photographs over the years. And we're going to take a look at some of these just classic images of this area. It's fantastic. So one of the things, it, and Steve Hoff talked about it earlier, was the Port Townsend Southern Railroad, Port Townsend Railroad. And that was owned by the Fox family. And they had their own little locomotive. That, now, this one's seen in Tacoma, but it, it worked for them for very many years. And eventually, the Milwaukee Road bought out the Port Townsend Southern in the mid-1970s. And they did that because they were splitting the profits from each carload with the Port Townsend Southern, and they'd rather kept all the money for themselves. So then they bought out the Port Townsend Southern. But when they did that, they got rid of the Port Townsend Southern train crew that loaded the barge at Port Townsend. So then the issue came, the train needed to make it from Port Angeles to Port Townsend, switch the barge, and make it back to Port Angeles under the what we call the hours of service law, which is the amount of time that a crew is allowed to actually operate a train. And, in, and, and originally it was 16 hours, but by with the time Allen was there in the 1970s, it was down to 12 hours. And it was difficult because, you, as Frank will explain this afternoon, you have tidal conditions, you have wind conditions, you've got all sorts of exogenous factors when you're trying to load this barge or unload the barge in Port Townsend. And so it was a real challenge. And so then what would happen was Alan is the station agent because they didn't like riding with the other guy. Alan is the station agent would get called in the middle of the night and they say, well, we've ran out of time and we're at Blinn, or we've ran out of time and we're at Gardner or, or wherever it is along the line. And so in the middle of the night, then Alan would have to go out either in his own car or the company car and find these guys and then bring them back into town. And of course, they'd always want to stop and get something to eat along the way. Now, this is a, a train. I, I got to look at this for a second. This is westward. So these would be trains from Port Townsend to Port Angeles. And you can see, you know, just as examples, you know, three loads, 19 empties, five loads, 18 empties. Here it just is running as a, as a, a, cabo a cab hop, what we call, which means that there's no cars in tow. And that just gives us a, you know, just kind of an idea of what traffic is like. We can kind of see what time they, they were arriving, what locomotives they were using. This is uh, from 1974, 1975, about the time that Alan was out there working. So here we have from right to left, 
Paul Heald, Butch Hilwick, Howard Hillman, Oral Freeman. Here's Oral Freeman right here. We'll see Oral again. And Johnny Jacobson, the brakeman here on the end. This is a Port Angeles photo in 1944. This is from Alan's collection. It's a great shot. We'll see some of these guys later. I love these pictures. Here we have a Steve Hoff photo showing the Milwaukee Road loading the barge in Port Townsend. And at one time, they had another track that ran along what that's what these piers or pilings were for was another track that formed a Y there at Port Townsend. And I know Frankie and I were there yesterday at Port Townsend and we looked around and you cannot, there is absolutely no trace of any of this stuff anymore. You, you got to kind of look to even think where it might have been at one time. So here we have another one of those classic John Illman shots. Here's the Christine with the, with the barge 20. And um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna cheat the program, folks. Frank, why don't you just come up here and join me for a second, okay? Why don't you come on up? This is Frank Sellerhoff, folks. Frank was the superintendent of the Seattle and North Coast Railroad. Worked for the Milwaukee Road for a number of years, and uh, very dear friend of mine. So come up here because you're gonna have to talk into the microphone, okay? That's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna have you help me with a couple of these questions. So here we have some more of these famous John Illman pictures. And the notation that we got for this particular photograph said that he was able to take the picture because the crew had stopped at Discovery Junction for lunch. That's it. And we can see Discovery Junction here. This is one of Mr. Elman's more famous photographs. This is just a classic image from 1953. This is right before the end of steam. Go ahead, Frank. I think one of the things you really want to notice here is, uh, is the size of the boxcars and the locomotive. So here you're talking about 40 foot box cars that are loaded with shingles and pretty lightweight stuff. And probably maximum load would be like maybe 40 ton. And here you got a locomotive here that's antiquated. Uh, and uh, and these, this train is run on 65 pound steel. That's 65 pounds for, th for every three feet. And, and when the Seattle North Coast Railroad came along, this same track was still 65 pounds, and we were trying to run 100 ton cars on it. Very difficult. Yeah, it got to be a little bit of a challenge, and we'll see that this afternoon when we talk about this stuff. So let's take a look at a few more of Mr. Elman's images of this train on this absolutely classic day, July 21st, 1953. Here we are closing in on Tukey's with the uh, uh, log boom, and I, I understand that they use these for either loading or unloading logs. And that's what this, I'm gonna call it a spar, I'm not a logging expert, but uh, something like that. And here's a couple of more images. Now, Mr. Illman describes this as Nelson's Landing, and there is a Nelson's Landing road up by Port Townsend. Uh, we think that this is crossing underneath Highway 20 in this photograph. So a couple of just absolutely classic images. Now I'm just gonna back up for a sec, sec. because you could see they got a, this kind of unusual box car here. And when we look at this train, that car, there's a tank car there now. And so we figured that this is a train coming back from Port Townsend now heading back towards Port Angeles. Here's another one of Mr. Illman's images. And this is at Maynard and there was a mill there that that uh, shipped uh, material to Peninsula Plywood. We could barely see the, the mill at, just at the far edge of the, at the picture. Here, here's something else that may interest you. Here's the 502. And you'll notice that there are three wheels under each, uh, three tires under each drive motor of that locomotive. And, and the reason the Milwaukee put the, that locomotive up there was to, make it spread its weight out on the 65 pound steel. And you'll see that when the pictures of the F7s, you'll only see two drive motors and you're talking about 1500 horsepower on the F7s. Here we got another picture. This is a Steve Hoff picture. Steve was our, our first presenter. And again, Frank is showing us the six axles here. And then this was a, Dana, what kind of mill was that? That was a peeler mill? Okay. So they would peel logs and, and peel the, sheets of it off and then they ship it to pen ply and they make plywood out of it then right or it could go either way i suppose here we have a classic picture of squim washington in 1953 
This is a Gary Oliver photograph, but we think the picture was taken by Stan Stiles. And there's a number of really sort of interesting elements in this photograph for us to enjoy. The vintage car, the water tank that existed in Squim during the steam era, they would run from Port Angeles, get water at Squim, go to Port Townsend, come back, get water at Squim again, and head back to Port Angeles. So the water tank is here in a couple of vintage cars. Um, just a, a lovely scene. Frank, go ahead. Something uh, very important to notice here, as you all folks all live here, is the fire hazard. You see the weeds and everything growing along the track there. That was a, a major situation, a major expense for the Seattle and North Coast Railroad to take care of. Do we have another question from the chat, Alan? Or, or um, Alan, uh, Aaron. There was a line down to Quilcene, and that was on the map that we saw earlier, but that was gone by the time that Alan worked in Port Angeles in the 1970s, and it was certainly gone by the Seattle and North Coast era. Uh, Steve kind of talked about that in his first presentation. Here we have another picture. Now, this is the same day, and these are the same people. Uh, and in this case, we happen to have a color photograph. Um, it's just great, isn't that? A Stan Stiles 1953 color photograph. And the Squim Depot was pretty interesting. Um, it, uh, um, the uh, station agent lived in the depot. So the station agent wrote a letter and he says, he's advised me that he would like to retire and take his pension on November 1st of 1944. This is right during the middle of World War II, folks and stated that Mrs. Gordon wanted to live in more comfortable quarters than those now provided. So I wrote Mr. Gordon and told him that as soon as possible, we would make some repairs to the living quarter and fix it up a little bit for him. And he, and he said that, uh, um, and on that basis, he arranged to stay on his job indefinitely. Now, I know as, an, as a former employer, I'm retired now, but if I had an employee and I said, all I gotta do is just put up a little paint and you'll be happy, I think that'd be a pretty good day. So anyway, it was quite interesting. Now, this might be the reason, because then they remodeled the depot, this might be the reason why later on, when they needed to use the train order signal, they couldn't get at the train order signal because the train order signal was now inside the agent's quarters. So, and uh, Ray Barbieria, we'll see Ray in a couple of more pictures here in a second. Here he is passing the depot in one of those SD7, SD9 locomotives in Aug Alan Miller's collection from 1973. And here's 533 Priest Road. You know, Priest Road's right out here on the way into town. And this would have been pretty close to the grade crossing that would have existed. So that's pretty close to where we are right now. And uh, now this is actually a C Seattle and North Coast train. This is one of the initial Seattle and North Coast trains when they were still using the Milwaukee Road locomotive during their first couple of months of operation. You remember those days, Frank? You remember when you remember the start of the North Coast? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, he says. I'll make a comment about, yeah. the, here. about the train master here. So here he's the train master and up on the Olympic Peninsula, and he's just taking care of 50 miles of track. Well, I was a train master for the Milwaukee Railroad. I took care of things from Cle Elm, South Cle Elm, through all the way to Seattle, up Pier 27, and handled the barges to boot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Alan and I worked together on a, a project uh, up at Cedar Falls last fall, and then we talked about the North Coast, and that's why we're here today. So one of the things that Alan told me about, Alan Miller told me about, about this photograph that was quite interesting, this is in the late 1970s, and the Milwaukee Road entered bankruptcy in, I want to say, in 1977, does that sound right? Yeah, okay, right in there. And then all of the fuel companies put the railroad on COD for their oil to be able to run their locomotives. So this became a, a serious hardship for the railroad to even try to exist. And so Alan explained in this picture what they were doing is the crew was going around and picking up every loose piece of scrap metal that they could sell so that they could buy fuel to run their trains. 
So, so that's kind of where life was like for that Milwaukee Road at that time. And guys like Frank and some of the other guys that are here that are Milwaukee Road guys, just amazing how they were able to, to persevere under some just incredibly difficult economic conditions. Hey, hang on, Frank's got a comment. I just, I just like to point out a gentleman here by the name of John Johnson. So Johnny here used to help unload these cars of uh, scrap, help me uh, and, and a couple other guys, uh, Jim Hell, who is, is not here. He's suffering from Agent Orange pretty bad. But uh, we, uh, we sold these things uh, on the Seattle waterfront to help pay our wages. <laughs> yeah, it was quite a heroic effort. I mean, you know, and, and we get into the North Coast this afternoon, it's heroic and hilarious simultaneously. So here's an image by Illman, let's say that five times fast, and this one is at Agnew, Washington. And it looks like to me, it's kind of early in the morning and they're heading back. If I got my directions right, no, it'd be, I don't have my directions right, I'm not gonna speculate, so. Um, and another picture, we saw one of Steve Hoff's pictures from the same sequence in his presentation with the train passing through Agnew late in the day. And you can see that by this point in time, things were getting a little lumpy on the railroad. So it's just, a, yeah, it's just a fancy track. And, and just the ability of these people to navigate these circumstances as successfully as they did is, is a testimony to their hard work and, and just their you know, gumption, for lack of a better word. Uh, here's a couple of pictures. Alan explained this one to me, that this was out of the, I believe, the Port Townsend newspaper, and the crew got a new diesel locomotive as a Christmas present that year, and this was 1953, when they were retiring the last of the steam engines. So we saw that steam engine sequence earlier in this presentation, and that was the summer of 1953. And now by December, it's gone and the Milwaukee actually dieselized completely by 1954. Here's a classic image of the 1220. Again, one of the locomotives that served out here and one of those John Illman famous photos that we can enjoy today. A beautiful downtown Port Angeles. And this is in the early days. We can see the Port Angeles what I believe the original Port Angeles Depot out on pilings. And, uh, um, you know, just kind of a classic photograph, I think, from the Cascade Rail Foundation collection. We keep our collection at the Pacific Northwest Railroad Archive in Burien, Washington, by the way. Here's a map that Alan Hand drew of various industries um, in the, would be the industrial area of Port Angeles. Um, the old line to dish in Twin Rivers, um, the uh, shingle mill, and what Alan told me about the M.R. Smith shingle loading spur is that there was a mill out west that made shingles, and then they would truck them into town and load them into boxcars here. And what was great about it is that the Milwaukee Road at that time had a lot of 40-foot boxcars that could hold maybe what, 40 tons, 50 tons at most, something like that. And the railroads had kind of switched to 100 ton box cars. And so they had a lot of these little 40, 50 ton box cars they couldn't really do much with, but the shingle mill could use those cars and the railroad had a lot of them. So it really worked out well for the railroad to be able to um, have those 40 foot cars to be able to load at that siding. So then there's um, the various industries up here. Some of this stuff was gone, of course, by Allen's time. Uh, the Port of Port Angeles Pier, the old depot tracks, and the third depot would be right there. Um, and I think the Red Lion would be down the street from that. Uh, here's a, an example of the road power that we used out here. Normally the 869 was the Milwaukee Roads locomotive but on some cases they would use other ones. In this case, Alan had a picture of the 665. So here's a picture that Steve Hoff uh, took for us of uh, Milwaukee Road 869, loading it on the dock. And Steve even managed to get a picture of his VW camper bus into the photograph. So that was, uh, you know, kind of like photobombing back in the old days. 
A uh, picture of Peninsula Plywood, uh, one of the big shippers here. They made siding and plywood and was a, a very, as we can see in this photograph, a very popular customer of the railroads. They would ship a lot of different things. So that was, um, that was good. And here's another picture of Peninsula Plywood, again, Steve Hoff's picture. And they were actually able to put cars inside and be able to load them then in all kinds of weather, which, you know, helped preserve the product that they were trying to ship for their customers. Uh, here we are on the scale track, and the clerk, Alan, told me that the clerk that worked at Port Angeles would come down and then help these guys load the cars, or excuse me, weigh the cars, and this fellow would be watching to direct traffic because the switch engine's down here, and then they put them on the, there's, there's two sets of tracks when we have a scale track. Here's a better picture of it. And this would be the live rail, which has actually got the scale associated with it so that they can weigh it. And then this rail doesn't, so that when they weigh it, they put them on these tracks. And when they don't weigh it, they keep them on those. And that way they know how much weight was in the car so that they know how much to bill the customer. These days they build freight cars pretty much specific for commodities. And so you don't need to weigh rail cars like you once needed to do. Uh, great picture from the Cascade Rail Foundation collection of what um, beautiful downtown Port Angeles looked like in that era. So here's that dock that we were looking at, okay? And then the depot's kind of up in here, and I think that's the Red Lion. And then here was the yard. In the, in the marina, which we'll look at here in a minute. It's just a classic picture. Actually, I think we got this from the Department of Ecology. And then a couple of pictures of the old drover's cabooses. And I took this one back in November. I actually was, you know, snuck out on the gravel, gravel company's uh, parking lot and took a picture of it because it is a classic Milwaukee Road caboose. And so we're coming to the end of our presentation here. And I just want to thank the Center for Railroad Photography and Art for and and specifically um, Adrian Evans and Gilbert Taylor, uh, the just Herculean effort in helping us retrieve these images and have these images available for us to be able to share with you today. And here's what Alan would look like if I could have gotten them on the screen and we'd had a little more success with that. And so Alan has presented a number of lectures for Historic Olympic Peninsula, and you can watch some of this information on Facebook. And Alan is a very uh, popular Facebook contributor. So I can leave that up there for a minute, make sure that we've got that. And on that happy note, I'm gonna say thank you everybody for our second presentation. It didn't go quite like I wanted technologically, but we've made it through. And off to lunch you guys go, and I'll see everybody back here at about 1.10 p.m. Thanks very much.